That was before the future came, and hunger, need, and want disappeared. Of course, they're making a comeback now, thanks to you. Michael Burnham, the Michael Burnham on my ship. Michael Burnham. Look at the way she brims with confidence, the way she maneuvers her way around to get what she wants, the way she always seems to know a lot about any given subject. But isn't everything just a touch too easy for her? In not a few conversations about Star Trek Discovery, the answer has been yes. Since the show premiered in September 2017, some of the harshest criticism leveled against Discovery has been that Michael Burnham is a terrible, flat failure of a character. That she is, in fact, a member of one of the most dreaded categories in fandom. A Mary Sue. So, let's examine that claim. First, a definition. A Mary Sue is a character, usually female, who is impossibly skilled and implausibly good. I volunteer as tribute! Typically a young girl, she enters an established world, amazes canon characters with her beauty and wisdom, and warps the plot so that she is at the center of it. It is customary, I think, to have an imaginary friend only during one's childhood. You are to be congratulated on your persistence. Renette. She has an exotic name, unusual eye color, and or fabulous hair. Take my hand. Everyone falls in love with her. A Mary Sue is particularly offensive when she is an idealized stand-in for the author, a type of wish fulfillment. Turn around. Now. Fittingly, perhaps, the concept of the Mary Sue originated in fanzines devoted to the Star Trek universe. The first fanzines were published while the original series was still in its inaugural season. By the early 1970s, fan fiction had seen such a glut of overly idealized young female characters that making fun of them became its own cottage industry. The name Mary Sue comes from one such story, a Trekkie's tale. The story was originally published anonymously in 1973 in a zine called Menagerie, but is now acknowledged as the work of the zine's editor, Paula Smith. In this one-page story, 15-year-old Lieutenant Mary Sue effortlessly charms Kirk, Spock, and McCoy, reveals herself to be half Vulcan, rescues the senior officers using a hairpin, runs the ship while the rest of the crew is ill, dies in a manner worthy of the most sentimental 19th century novel, and has her birthday commemorated as, quote, a national holiday of the Enterprise. Nowadays, any too perfect character in any property with a fandom can be accused of being a Mary Sue. Male characters are not immune. They can be called out as a Marty Sue or a Gary Stew. And the internet is littered with litmus tests for writers of fan fiction to evaluate their characters. Depending on the list or the litmus test, there are literally dozens of markers for a Mary Sue. And that brings us back to Star Trek Discovery and Michael Burnham. Let's take on a few of the markers that seem most likely to connect. So I was on vacation. I get used to being rich. I went to the moon today. Criticism number one. Michael Burnham is impossibly talented. She serves on the Sinjo as a xenoanthropologist. Her specialty is understanding the cultures of alien species. She can out-science the science officer, she has rocket pack skills, and she can out-logic a ship's computer. She can perform the Vulcan neck pinch, mostly, fight Klingons, and silence irritating new roommates. I'll call you Mickey. I think that's a little more approachable. No, you won't. Oh, yeah, no, I won't. She finds anomalies in computer code, serves on away missions, engineers alien transmitters, and eats a nutritious lunch. Cooked tomatoes are a great source of lycopene. Remember that. Oh my god, you are so scary. Two appetizing and nutrient-filled burritos. And all of this at her relatively young age. So Burnham's talents are varied and impressive. But does this make her a Mary Sue? Consider. The marker of a Mary Sue is a set of inexplicably incredible skills. But Burnham's skills come with a backstory. She was trained from a young age at the Vulcan Learning Center, 
and she studied quantum physics at the Vulcan Science Academy, where she received high marks. She served under Captain Giorgio for seven years, learning every step of the way. If Burnham didn't have so much to recommend her, she wouldn't be qualified to serve as a Starfleet officer. Plus, the explanation for the origins of her skills sets up the conflicting loyalties that pull on her throughout the first season. Logic versus emotion, Vulcan philosophy versus Starfleet ideology. Score so far? No. 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 Criticism number two. Michael Burnham has an implausible connection to canon characters, namely Spock. This breaks canon because Spock never mentioned having a human foster sister. It's true that Spock didn't mention Michael Burnham, but he also didn't mention his older half-brother Cybok, the main character of the fifth Star Trek film, The Final Frontier. So there's precedent for family connections to suddenly appear as Trek writers expand the universe. We have traveled far! In Discovery, for the first season at least, Burnham's most important family relationship is not to Spock, but to his father, Sarek. Sarek and his wife Amanda raised Burnham after her parents were killed in a Klingon raid. After an attack on Vulcan by logic extremists, Sarek saved her life by performing a mind meld. As a result, Burnham shares a piece of his katra, or soul. Sure, these details might also play into the Mary Sue criticism of having a tragic backstory, but these experiences don't make life simple for Burnham, and they're not just a device to give her unearned credibility. Instead, Burnham's primary struggle in the first few episodes is to balance her Vulcan upbringing with her human instincts and emotions. That's earned complexity and good enough characterization. Score? No. 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 Criticism number three. Michael Burnham has an exotic name. Giving her a male name is a cheat to make her seem more interesting. So yes, typically male names are, well, typically applied to male characters. I guess we could forget for a second that in English, many names now used for girls used to be more common to boys. Whitney, Beverly, Lindsay, and Ashley. More directly relevant to Discovery is the fact that writer Brian Fuller has a habit of giving male names to his female leads, like George in Dead Like Me. You're gonna die eventually, so why speed up the process? And Chuck in Pushing Daisies. Well, I figured since it cost me my life, I should get to keep at least one. And about Michael Burnham specifically, he has said that he and the other writers found Michael a compelling name and liked the connection with a certain protective archangel. And it's not like Fuller went way over the top with something like Starlight Onyx Multiversia Caritas Burnham, or Emperor Philippa Giorgio Augustus Iaponius Centaurus. Score? No. No. Maybe. No. Nah. Criticism number four. Burnham's characterization obsesses over her beauty. This is one of the Mary Sue's most common and most important markers. In Discovery, Burnham is attractive, and in the Mirror Universe, she does wear sexy sleepwear. But depictions of her in public spaces far and away emphasize her strength. Her beauty is not used as a weapon or a tool, and it doesn't make other characters fall at her feet. Her fighting skills do that. Contrast this to Trek's own original series, in which women were usually shot in soft focus to emphasize their attractiveness. Even as late as The Next Generation, the camera wanted to flatter female characters. Discovery, in contrast, clearly has an interest in Burnham's personality and evolution as a character. Score? No. 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 No! <laughs> that was great! That was great! Criticism number five. Burnham has an exotic eye color. Quick check. Um, nope. Looks like a regular set of human eyes. Score? No! No. 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 Criticism number six. Burnham has exotic hair. The most Mary Sue of Mary Sue's has long flowing hair, usually of an unusual color. So Burnham definitely doesn't fit that trait. Host Mutiny Burnham keeps her hair short, and she stops straightening it in the Vulcan style, but nothing about her hairdo is unusual given modern American trends. It is possible there could be an accidental or intentional subtext regarding Burnham's various hair arrangements and the natural hair movement. 
but that's an essay for another day. Score? No. No! No. 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 Criticism number seven. Other characters fall in love with her. So, maybe? This one lands to some degree because Burnham is involved in interlocking love triangles. There's Burnham Tyler Laurel, or is it Burnham Valk Laurel? Or is it a quadrangle because Ash Valk is technically two people? Hmm, I'll have to think about that one. In the Terran Imperial universe, Burnham is caught in a not exclusively romantic triangle between Emperor Giorgio and Lorca and one corner of the triangle apparently got a lot creepier as Burnham grew up. Now, it's not that unusual for romance to be a part of Star Trek. Other characters fall in love, Starfleet officers get married, some even have children. It is true that Discovery takes the unusual approach of making Burnham's romantic relationship central to the plot and introduces it relatively early. But her relationship with Tyler isn't just a superfluous subplot. It serves as a way to show her complexity and motivate her growth. Burnham has to get in touch with her human emotions so she can reach out to him, and Tyler coaches her through some of this development, giving her an anchor and a focus. And of course, he serves as a source of heartbreak when Volk re-emerges. So yes, it's unusual to see such emphasis on a romantic relationship, but the relationship is far more complex than it would be if Burnham were simply a Mary Sue. Score? No. 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 Maybe. Criticism number eight. Burnham is always right. Hell no. She might be right that the Klingons need a Vulcan hello, but she's not right that Starfleet principles allow her ship to fire first. And she's not right that mutiny is the answer. In fact, in her speech at the end of the season, she might as well be talking to herself. Score? No. 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 Nah. No. Criticism number nine. Burnham warps the plot or changes the behavior of the main characters. This one can be tricky. First, the criticism of a Mary Sue is that she walks into an established set of characters and changes their behavior so it becomes all about her. And that's not what happens with Burnham. She's not walking into the original series or any other Trek show. Sure, she's apparently going to hang out with the crew of the Pike Captained Enterprise in season two, but Discovery seems to want to be a new branch of the Star Trek tree. But it is also true that most of the plot points in Discovery center on Michael. She is our point of view character from the first episode, and the primary arc of the season takes her from mutineer to hero, through her first love, in and out of a mirror universe, and over a broken heart. This focus on a single character is quite different from previous Trek shows, in which the attention was spread among an ensemble cast. For better or worse, Discovery isn't taking that route. Michael is the main character, and the ensemble crew, as interesting as they are, serve a supporting role. Michael isn't a captain, but she moves among them, as contributor to the deaths of Captain Giorgio and Captain Lorca, as a witness to the invention of fake Captain Killy. Perhaps Michael herself will achieve the rank of captain in a future season, but for now, and at the very least, She's the needle pulling the thread of plot among officers of higher rank. But this setup doesn't warp the plot. It's an alternative way to structure the show, and it goes hand in hand with a serialized approach. The writers have given us one main story arc, and for that we need a single main protagonist. It's just possible that some viewers who don't like Michael as a character actually don't like the writers changing the traditionally episodic structure of the show, and that's a fair criticism but it doesn't make Michael a Mary Sue. Score? No. 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 Nope. Discovery isn't a perfect show, and it's true that the last three episodes of Discovery's first season flatten out some of the complex characterization built before the mid-season break. But we imagine that there's much more to come for Michael Burnham, and we'll need at least a couple more seasons before we know her as well as we know Kirk, Picard, Cisco, and Janeway. So, is Michael Burnham a Mary Sue? For us at Trek Expertise, we're gonna go with no. Thank you for watching. If you like this and other essays on this channel, then hit subscribe and turn on notifications so you don't miss the next one. More importantly, consider supporting us through Patreon. Patreon is the best way to help create more Trek Expertise. 
All relevant links are in the subspace below. And be sure to take a look at our latest Antarctic adventures over on our other channel. Thanks. See you soon. Toy Show, Ryo. Kangai de Mioyo.